clinical determinants of health on healthcare and patient outcomes. So he has some really great insights to share with us today, specifically about the topic we're discussing. And of course, our other guest speaker is the founder and CEO of the ACMA, Dr. William Solomon. Dr. Solomon is a former pharmaceutical industry executive, and he's been featured on Fox News, ABC News, Forbes, and more. And it's considered by many one of the foremost thought leaders on the latest issues and topics in the pharmaceutical industry. He earned his PhD from Columbia University and his bachelor's degree from New York University with a background in biochemistry. So as you can see, we do have the experts here joining us today. Um, so welcome to our speakers. Thank you both for, for joining us. And with that, I will hand over the mic to Kiana to get us started. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylin. So as Kaylin mentioned, my name is Kiana. I am the pharmacist and the life sciences associate here with ACMA. I develop and I work with our industry experts and other subject matter experts in the content development of all of our activities. Today, I'll act as your moderator this afternoon and lead the conversation between Dr. Bulis and Dr. Solomon. So as we get started, this afternoon, the ACMA will lead the discussion of medical affairs tools and trends by first introducing and laying the foundation of what insights look like. Right, what do these insights look like in medical affairs and how these different types of insights are actually gathered? We'll then go into the different types of tools and technology platforms that are used in pharma and why the features in them are important for different types of insights. At the end, we will wrap up with questions and answers from the audience. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to leave them in the Q&A section of your Zoom and we'll address those at the end. Um, please ensure that these questions, they should be specifically for either Dr. Solomon or Dr. Boulez. Any additional questions that you have referring to the ACMA, um, those will actually be answered directly to those inquiring via your email. All right, so before we, we dive into the actual content in this webinar, it is noted that Dr. Boulez is employed by Takeda, but the opinions offered during this webinar does not directly reflect the opinion of Takeda. All right, first, let's go ahead and discuss the, the purpose of gathering insights in pharma to drive the overall strategy of a product and how these insights are gathered by the medical affairs team. All right, what are medical, uh, medical affairs insights? Medical affairs teams, they gather and they analyze medical and scientific <laughs> information to support their company's products. This information is used to facilitate the product at the development stage, during promotion, and also in scientific exchanges with healthcare providers on the appropriate use of a company's products. So all of these insights, they're used to paint the larger image of a strategy for a drug product. Now we're gonna take a look at some of those key insights that medical affairs teams gather. All right, so first being clinical trial data, right? Now bringing our experts up next and how this data is used as insights to drive that strategy. Medical affairs teams can monitor the competitive landscape of other products in the same therapeutic area. They also engage with KOLs or key opinion leaders and gather those insights from them on their patient population and the medical needs of patients. Medical affairs teams use real world data. These teams also monitor legal and ethical requirements to ensure their company meets these requirements. All right, so we have our experts on the webinar this afternoon. So I'm interested from you, Mina and Will, you know, we have the purposes of each insight here in this table, but how do medical affairs teams use clinical data, KOL insights and knowing about their competition to mold a strategy for a product? Mina, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, so you know it, it's it's a culmination of taking the to your point the clinical data and having that in part of your scientific exchange. I think the the key focus here is driving and identifying insights. I think maybe even taking a step back is differentiating what is an insight versus what is information and facts that you may be able to receive. Having that ability to exchange uh, science and to be able to leverage data, because in medical affairs, data is our currency, right? Across the board, that's how we build trust. That's how we 
are remain unbiased. And so leveraging clinical uh, study data or real world evidence data for that matter, um, to understand where the challenges are, where the gaps are, what's working well, um, what do our clinicians and our HCPs do in their day-to-day -day practice, and then really understanding where the insight is generated and taking that back to the final approach or final strategy. Um, you know, we, we talk about strategy probably um, all day long, and strategy is very dynamic. We, we have a, a, a strategy that we set forth, but we have to also be flexible based on the unmet needs that we hear uh, through insight generation. Will, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, no, I think those are all great points. Uh, this has been an area that I think uh, has been less so much about the tools that help you to gather the insights. Is, I think it's more focused on, I think from a challenge perspective for medical lawyers, more on what or whether those insights are really valuable or beneficial and really understanding when you're collecting information, what's going to help drive the strategic imperatives within the medical affairs function. And, I know for today, Kiana, you know, we want to focus a lot on tools and technology. And I would actually say that, you know, with the advent of any advances within um, technology, especially when it comes, I think, to things like pre predictive analytics and modeling, now that medical affairs has access to large data sets, when you think about gathering insights to help them, for example, put together a proper clinical trial, let's say a, you know, a company sponsored study, or to determine you know, what their focus should be for ISRs you know, and, and data generation, or even for medical education. Um, I think all those areas are areas where insights that come in are really important, and you need to make sure that you're mining large amounts of information, that you're getting a really good, I guess, sample size that's representative of what the needs are of the stakeholders. Ultimately, you know, from my standpoint, if you're gathering insights, what the primary focus of those insights should be is to help you better serve your stakeholders, your external stakeholders, your KOLs, which obviously, you know, translates to their patients and what their patients need in terms of supporting their patients. So I think definitely making sure that you have the right tools in place and technology to make sure that you're harnessing data that's giving you a kind of a full 360 degree picture of what the landscape looks like, whether it's the competitive landscape, whether it's data gaps in terms of determining, you know, what, what pieces of information uh, are, would be beneficial or used for, for KOLs, so forth and so on. So I definitely think, you know, with everything happening now, with the more, greater sophistication with data science and, like I said, predictive analytics, this is going to be something that medical affairs should be much more effective at doing, if that makes sense. It does, definitely. Like you mentioned, um, with technology, we're able to gather this grand amount of information that's available, clean them up, and then spit out those insights that we have. All right. So before we, we dive into how technology has advanced these particular insights, let's take a look at how these insights were gathered in the past, right? To understand the impact that technology actually has on these insights. You know, Will, what was your experience in collecting these key insights, such as these like clinical data, um, KOL insights in the past as an MSO director? So, you know, when I led the, the field medical team at different positions that I had, the, you know, in the beginning it was really spreadsheets, you know, back in the day. And then we evolved, you know, we had uh, different tools. We had a CRM tool and the CRM tool evolved and it was able to collect information. But honestly, the biggest thing was that one, the information came in and if the information was good, oftentimes it wasn't followed through on. So I think that's actually a big thing, just from a practice and process workflow perspective. When those insights come in, who's actually looking at those insights? How are they being organized and gathered? And then what's the process you have internally to actually do something with them? Um, the second thing I would say is that there wasn't always consistency among the field medical team and how we define an insight. So a lot of times it's the information coming in wasn't a quote unquote insight. Then it was just, you know, information that really was nice to know, but not necessarily a need to know. Again, not driving the overall medical affairs strategy. So to me, you know, the, the, again, the challenge isn't so much the technology. The technology is there. 
You know, we have companies out there now that are providing very good platforms to gather these insights and organize that information. Um, I know we're going to talk about AI later on, but with AI now, AI tools and natural language processing tools, it, you know, sentiment tools, you can take large amounts of information and make sense of what that information means and organize it in such a way that, again, you can easily kind of comb through it and then come up with what your next decision point should be. So I don't think that's the challenge. I think the challenge is more making sure that the field medical team is consistently understanding what an insight is. And I think that, to me, that goes back to training and upskilling and making sure that, you know, people within medical affairs all have a clear idea and uniformly understand what that skill around insight collecting looks like and what that should be. Yeah, that's a really good point. Mina, you brought up earlier as well, you know, there's a clear difference between information that you gather and then what you do with that information being an insight. Um, can you expand more on what you think the difference is just collecting information and how to turn that into an insight? Yeah, no, so we, I, I think we, we run into this issue quite frequently is that we're, we're gathering large amount of information or insight from the field and we think it's all valuable, but delineating what is truly impactful from a strategic perspective, I think sometimes that's where we get caught and we can't differentiate either. And so to me, information is essentially what's happening, the what that we can identify in the field and in our key scientific exchange. The insight is the why, so the why behind the what. And you're able to delineate that and carve that out from your exchanges and conversations and discussion, I think that is the, the piece that Bill was referring to, the insight that gets, you know, um, dissected from all the, the discussions and gets trickled up to the teams, to the to those that are setting strategy. I think, you know, something else that we should take into consideration is from the field perspective side, we deliver all these uh, uh, insights and what happens with them? Do they sit in a box somewhere? Do they sit on someone's email, on a spreadsheet? To your point, Will, I think that frustration will certainly set in to, you know, month after month, you're generating what you think is insights and it's not going anywhere. So I think it's also kind of an onus on um, the, the counterpart, you know, internally for strategy to have conversations, to really dig deep into those insights because nine out of the 10 times when you have that conversation, you get a bit more clarity. And then to your point, you'll have an opportunity to refine your strategy, which is a continuous process. Yeah, and I think, you know, one thing we didn't touch on is it's not just insights for medical affairs. Remember, some of those insights can be insights for marketing, for sales, for market access, for reimbursement. So you might hear information that is useful for other functional, for clinical, for other functional groups to know about. And I think when we talk a lot of medical affairs about, you know, having a seat at the table and bringing value internally and whatnot, these are really, really big ways to do that. You know, um, from my experience in working, you know, we work with a lot of medical affairs teams uh, at the ACMA. And I think one of the, the, the themes that I see in those teams that struggle in terms of really trying to figure out how they can have a greater seat at the table and a greater voice is that they're not always bringing that value, those insights to help their counterparts and their functional groups uh, be more effective or, you know, have information that can help them make better decisions. So, you know, with medical affairs, remember the average uh, field medical person uh, is having an interaction about 45 minutes on average. Compare that with a pharmaceutical sales rep, it's less than a minute. So it's a huge difference. So, you know, if you think about it, an MSL, when they're going out there and talking to a stakeholder, they're gathering massive amounts of information relative to their commercial counterparts on average. And, you know, I'm sure within those discussions, there's definitely nuggets of information there that are going to be critical. And I think, again, it goes back to do, does the field medical folks, do they have the skills and the understanding of really, yes, this is an insight. And here's what I'm going to, here's what I'm going to communicate it to. And then internally, do you have a process to actually do something with it? I think that's the key ultimately when it comes to insights. Yeah. So it sounds like from both of you, the step one is education, right? Understanding fully the difference between information gathered and how to process that into an insight, the difference between those. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, because remember, you know, 
it's a, it's a different kind of skill, right? It's almost like a, it, you know, the idea of going out and meeting with a KOL and then having, you know, gathering that business intelligence or competitive intelligence, it's a different type of skill to look for that and to have discussions that help create opportunities that maximize that. Um, and I think that's something that for a lot of people, they really had never been trained on or they never learned about, right? If you think about the majority of people in medical affairs, they're physicians, they're pharmacists, they're PhDs. You know, I know as a PhD, I wasn't trained on that, right? So that this is something we assume that people are going to just pick up, but it's really a skill, you know, and there, there's, there's, out, you know, there's, there's conferences and events that just focus on competitive intelligence gathering and business intelligence and how to actually do that in an effective way. So I think if people had that, that skill set, uh, they, they could do so much more in terms of bringing those insights back and then again, bringing the value, right? One of the biggest challenges for field medical, I think, um, is there isn't always a lot of new data. And so when they go out to meet with a doctor, um, it's like sometimes they feel like they're not bringing as much value in terms of the information they provide. Um, and, and that can be a challenge. And so for their company, sometimes that puts into question, you know, how much value is the field medical team bringing if there isn't that much new data. But I think with insights in, in the reverse, if there's information that's coming in that's really valuable, that can be huge for the company in many ways, you know, in terms of new product development, new indications, so forth and so on. Um, so yeah, it's, this, is a very, this is a big topic. I mean, this could be a webinar in and of itself, Kiana, but um, it's a topic I'm very passionate about because I do think it starts here with really good insights. I, I would agree with you. And just to add on to that, again, kind of looking from the field perspective, what is that coming full circle to your point, the process of first understanding information versus insight, what we do with that internally, how it shapes and refines on a continuous basis. But then what does that field member do with it afterwards? That sort of feedback, what has it changed internally? How have you made an impact into your field? How do I bring back value to my scientific exchange so that, you know, as I'm meeting a um, professor or doctor in the field, um, I can share with them that that insight that you shared with me, you know, we're, we're acting upon it or it has led to additional conversations and we're part of that conversation. So it's also that, that trusting ongoing relationship where the KOL or the HCP also feels that they brought value to the conversation. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. So gathering all these insights, you know, before technology, the MSL, the field medical affairs professional, they had to gather it manually. Right. So imagine all these data points that you're mentioning that they had to, to gather and collect manually. Um, you're at risk of missing out on something really important. Right. If you haven't researched and you haven't touched base on all pertinent resources, um, it's very time consuming. So you're also at risk of not being up to date with the latest developments if you're not manually refreshing and checking in regularly. So that's also where, where technology comes in, right? To, to lift that heavy burden off of you. All right, so now medical affairs teams, they have access to a variety of tools and technologies that make it easier to gather these insights on clinical data, the competitive landscape, those KOL insights. Um, and some of these technologies, they include features such as these here, right? Data analytics. CRM tools, social media monitoring, and social media listening, um, and even EHRs. I'm interested to hear from, from you here, on our experts, our speakers here on the call. It sounds as if technology can really do two things, right? You can, they can gather this information for you, but do you also expect the technology to turn that information into an insight for you? Or is there always going to be a professional there that just explains it for you? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a great question. It's probably twofold, right? So it, it's probably the, the first and the, the latter. The, the first being, you know, where you're, where you're heading with this is where technology is developing in 2023 and beyond. And to Will's earlier comment, I think that's where AI, natural language processing, machine learning comes into play to, to, to the comment you made of, you know, can you take that information and uh, Put a bow tie on it and say here's the final product here's what the insight looks like or here's what the relevant information uh, we were able to dissect um, so I, I think that's where technology comes into a, a pretty large play here and in many of these um, items that you have listed here 
they're continuously growing, they're continuously being refined on how to make the um, exchange, the identification of information uh, more readily accessible, less time consuming, kind of taking the, the convenience factor to a higher level. Now, we need to be able as humans uh, feed the, the model or the algorithm uh, the right information. So it's basically like teaching a child um, and learning um, kind of that learning and development model where you're as much as you teach it, as much as it'll return the investment back to you. Now, machines and data are very unbiased, but they are biased from the developer that makes them. So we have natural inherent biases um, that may be reflected. So we have to do a better job at making sure that we're very objective on how we build our tools. I agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to add, I, I agree with everything Mina said. I think, you know, when I look at this list that you've laid out here, one of the things we haven't really talked much about is social media monitoring tools. And I think this goes back to the idea of sentiment. Um, now we're seeing that a KOL, as we define a KOL or an external expert, I know some companies call them, as we define those individuals, uh, that definition is changing to become less bibliometric, more sociometric. Meaning that now a lot of the uh, external experts who are out on, you know, a lot of the social media channels like Instagram or YouTube or TikTok, um, and they have, you know, a million followers. Um, they're, they're, and a lot of those followers are obviously physicians, the lay public. You can argue that those individuals are kind of like a, a key opinion leader, even if they haven't published necessarily, uh, you know, in, in, in peer to peer, peer reviewed journals or haven't presented at major conferences they're still influencing the practice of medicine. Because if you think about it, we know from a lot of studies that have been done on millennial physicians, they get a lot of their information from social media, surprisingly. And they're not interested in meeting as much with uh, the industry face-to-face. -face. So, you know, that's huge. That's a huge paradigm shift. Now you've got a situation where your physicians, the younger physicians, are really looking to engage with the industry in a very different way. And so I think for the industry, they've got to find ways to engage them differently using these technologies, but also to be more strategic in determining who are, who, how are they going to define who a KOL is? You know, and that, that, that definition of a KOL and how they're going to come up with their list of cables that they're going to meet with in their particular territory. Um, so it's different now. It's, it's a very different game than it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago, even I would say six, seven years ago. It's very different than it is today. And so I think when I look at that list, to me, the social media element and the sentiment element really, really stands out a lot. I think it's going to be a bigger area of focus for us more than ever because if you think about it, your, your external stakeholders, particularly HCPs, they can get information, you know, relatively easily. Uh, you know, actually, Kiana, I ran a, uh, a chat GPT. Everybody knows what chat GPT is, I think, I think on, on the call, but it's the new AI platform. It's, it's gotten a lot of buzz lately in the last few months where you type in a question and it gives you back, it spits out an answer using this AI bot. And so I actually put in, uh, two different types of questions, one on the role that AI plays in medical affairs, and another one asking get a question on, as if I'm a physician, on its recommendations. If I have a patient that comes in, you know, in this case I put in uh, with elevated, isolated LDL cholesterol, what, what, is the, what do the American Heart Association guidelines say? And, you know, maybe let's take a look at it. I think you're sharing it here. Uh, is this the... Um, the AHA one or the medical affairs one? I can't really see. It's kind of small. This is the AHA. Uh, we also have your your AI question here. Yeah. So if you look at the AI question, um, you know, basically I'm asking how does AI how how is AI going to impact medical affairs? And I don't know if the if the audience can see it, but when you take a look at the the response, it's pretty amazing. You know what this AI bot is able to do, and I, I would say it's it's fairly spot on. Really spot on. And so and if you go to the next one, the, the one on the American Heart Association, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see here 
again, very, very spot on. And, you know, I think just uh, recently, Mina, uh, you're, you're a physician, I think you would appreciate this. I think they gave ChatGPT the medical boards, the step one exam, and I think it passed, if I'm not mistaken. Did you see this in the news? Yeah, I did, I did see that recently in the news. So <laughs> it, it's game changing on every level. And I think one of the things that we should, um, I guess, be, be come to consensus on is this is here to stay. And it's only going to grow, be more refined, evolve. Um, you know, the, the, to your example that you gave on the medical affairs, what's that going to look like when you put in that same question a year from now? As the field evolves, we want to make sure you know, things like these tools are evolving alongside. And so um, it's going to be really nice to see across the coming years um, how these tools evolve. In the healthcare landscape, I think you can think of multiple and a plethora of, of opportunities to apply this sort of technology everywhere from the patient aspect, the provider aspect, and the healthcare system in general. You think of the question and, and put it in here, it's gonna be a game changer on multiple levels. Again, going back to that convenience factor, um, to your point, you put in a, a, a general question on guidelines. You need to know that in, in three seconds, it's right there for me. Right. Yeah. So I think I think the you know the the ability to ascertain information so quickly, it really changes the game. Because remember here. It's not like when you Google something, you get a bunch of ads and then you get, you know, choices of different websites you can go to. And I might pick one website, you might pick another. Here, you know, you're getting a very definitive answer. Now, if, you know, I think ChatGPT, in this data that I saw in the first two months, it exceeded a lot of the major websites in terms of the number of users. I think it reached a million users like in less than 30 days or something like that. Um, I think Angry, Angry Birds was, was second <laughs> in terms of users. So, uh, you know, to me, what that tells me is that um, this is going to get widespread use. It's, it's, that's a strong predictor of long-term use, you know, worldwide. Um, so it's going to be ubiquitously used. And, and so what that's going to mean is now your healthcare providers, they're, you know, probably they're going to rely more and more on tools like this. So I think the thing for medical affairs to think about is, how do we complement the variety of tools that physicians have available to them to, to get information so that we're still bringing value? I think to me, that's the question. You know, right. the, that's, the, that's a big question. And the second big question is, how does medical affairs ensure that the tools they're paying for, the technology they're investing in, they're actually maximizing it to the greatest degree? Um, I used to work for uh, a company called Viva, okay? And um, I think, Mina, I'm sure you've heard of Viva. You know, a lot of companies utilize Viva. And um, one of the glaring things that I noticed when I would go out to different pharmaceutical companies was that most people weren't maximizing really all the bells and whistles uh, that, this, that, that Viva provided, you know, in different platforms they offered. Um, and the truth is, a lot of it is you just kind of get caught up in the day-to-day, -day, you know, of your job. And you're not really thinking about how to make these tools work and integrating them in your day-to-day -day. so that's why i'm a big believer of you know especially us the acma when people implement our tools you know from a training perspective in terms of board certifying their teams i'm really big on onboarding and like ensuring successful implementation because people you know will pay tons of money for a tool in our case a learning management system and then they're not always maximizing the insights the analytics they get from the tool to really make the most of it so, you know, again, you're only going to get in what, you know, you're only going to get out what you put in, so to speak. So I think to me with technology, those are the two, th two big questions on for medical affairs. How will you complement that you're still bringing value externally to your stakeholders? And number two, how are you going to ensure that you're really maximizing the usage of the tools? That's a really good question. You know, Will, that brings up also, how can you foresee or how can medical affairs teams stay ahead of the curve, right? And prepare for these future changes in their field? Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's a, a, a really good segue into staying, staying updated with everything that comes out. I think to your point, mm -hmm. we have tools that may be user friendly, but there's too many bells and whistles. And so you get caught up in what you need to do, what you need to accomplish for the day, and you don't really get to optimize and maximize the tool in front of you. So I think 
having the opportunity uh, wherever you work to really focus on uh, taking time to explore these tools. What's going to, you know, when you look at a tool, what's going to make um, the most sense strategically? What's going to make the most sense for me um, to reduce, you know, the burden of time? Because everybody's on the go, right? You want to make sure that you're getting that information, you're maximizing it. It's done in such a way where it's not creating a more of a time burden on you. And oftentimes, many companies have kind of a, a data resource uh, department or a data and technology department. So really partnering up with your internal stakeholders to dive into the tools that are available, dissect them, understand what are the pros, what are the cons, what are some of the limitations. And I, I believe that will keep, keep you up to date on a daily. And again, it's going to be hard to stay up to date because there's a constant evolution, even as we're speaking. So Mina, I have a question for you. What in your mind, so you're at Takeda, in your mind, you know, without revealing, you know, a brand, what would you say are like the three must have tools? If you're if you're working in medical affairs, if you were gonna you just you're at a new biotech and you're building out a medical affairs function, a lot of the people listening today, they might be working at a small biotech, they're coming up on phase three, they're gonna begin to build out a medical affairs group. You know, you tell them, look, out of the box, you need these three tools. What would you say those three tools are? Well, clarify a little bit more for me, like in, in terms of like the medical strategy and field medical, what, what are we if, if you're in general with the medical affairs, right? Do you, is it like, I'll give you an example. Is a CRM a must have? Like, do you need to have a CRM? Is that like a must have? Do you need to have, you know, if you're gonna have a CRM, do you need to have a, a tool that helps you profile your KOLs and identify your KOLs? Are those like a must haves? That's kind of what I'm referring to just in general overall. Yeah, I, I definitely. Those those types of tools, CRMs, and how to identify the KOL goes back to two things. So from a CRM perspective, you want to be able to have that so you can document your interactions to be able to say, you know, I did have a, a touch point with this physician or this CP and be able to refer back to that at any point in time. Um, so that I think from even from a compliance perspective, it's, it's essential. Now, the type of tool that you use kind of differs from uh, team to team and organization to organization, but also keeping in mind what is going to be ease of use in, in that tool. Uh, how does that tool set itself apart from other tools? I think the, the, the ACP finding tools um, and getting you know, more details on your ACP, that helps with your planning, as we spoke about earlier. As you're going through that insight, uh, exchange in your mind before you meet with an ACP, I want to know as much as I can about the ACP so I can have a better informed discussion. So I think tools that will help you be better at your job and not necessarily do your job for you, but put you at a, at a, at a advantage when you go in to speak, you know that HCP, you know what their interests are. To your point, are they a social media influencer or social media leader? Um, are they, you know, at the podium? Are they in guideline committees, things of that sort? That helps you from kind of a field perspective and understand what, are, what is it that I need and what is it that I'm walking into to be better prepared. He is internally, I think you also hit on this earlier, is I want to stay up to date with, with the competitors. I want to stay up to date from a scientific perspective with the competitors. Because in medical affairs, we're unbiased. We're you know, focused on science. We want to advance the science. And we want to be able to have those uh, diligent conversations around science and be well educated as we have that scientific exchange to know what is the field evolving into from the clinical study perspective and how is that impacting the country. Now, in, in many therapeutic areas, they, they may be crowded therapeutic areas, and you have a lot to go through to bring yourself up to speed. So what sort of tools can help me optimize my time management so that I can educate myself um, in the most efficient way possible? Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree. I mean, um, I think that what, when I look, I, just to go back to the, I see stuff, the chat GPT up. So when I look at the, the response of chat GPT, you know, so personalized medicine, you know, in terms of how AI is going to impact pharma and medical affairs, I think you would agree with that, Mina, right? I mean, the idea that if you have the ability to harness and look at large sets of, sets of data on patients, you know, from maybe insurance databases, other databases, 
you can use that information, use predictive analytics and modeling, and then be able to kind of figure out who's more likely to benefit from particular drugs based on the genetic or other data. The second thing is, of course, data analysis, again, large, analyzing large amounts of data, adverse events, medical literature to automate some of those tasks. So that, that, that in and of itself, automating some of that analysis that's done right now manually. The third thing that they mentioned is medical information management. So as you guys know, obviously, medical information plays a really important role in supporting HCP, so helping to automate the process of organizing, analyzing, disseminating the information to physicians externally. Patient engagement. Um, this I found interesting. AI-powered chatbots and virtual assistants can help improve patient engagement by providing personalized information and support. And I don't know if you guys know, there, there's actually a few uh, patient forums out there online where they talk about their particular disease states. Um, and so, you know, the patients, obviously, patient advocates we know over the last 10 years or so have gotten a much greater voice kind of at the table when it comes to even things like, you know, clinical outcomes and studies and things like that and what matters to patients. So this I found interesting with the issue of power chatbots. And then regulatory compliance. Medical affairs teams are responsible for ensuring that all med medical communications are compliant with regulatory requirements. AI can help ensure compliance by analyzing communications, right? So MLR review, right, which we do now manually, right? Um, we kind of look at the promotional materials. What this is suggesting is that AI could potentially review those communications for any potential issues. So that I found interesting. I don't think anybody's comfortable yet to do that. You know, it, it reminds me of if you've ever gotten in a, in a car, those self-driving cars, the first time it's like you feel a little shaky, right? You're kind of nervous. And so I think it's kind of the same thing here. I, I would feel nervous if I was sitting on the MLR committee and, you know, an AI bot was reviewing the communications and the guidance. But I, I found this fascinating. And like I said, I thought it was pretty spot on. Um, I don't know. Do you guys have any thoughts? So I guess in, in terms of what you just um, stated, I think personalized medicine will is something that the field, the industry, the healthcare system has been striving for over the last several years. I think in the coming years, at least in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see it from the therapeutic aspect. We're going to see it from an HCP aspect. It really fills in on all levels, right? So we're having more personalized medicines that are being developed across multiple therapeutic areas based on the patient needs, based on patient characteristics, based on, to your point, who's who may you know benefit the most from one therapy over another. I think we'll see it on that patient level as well. What are my needs as a patient? Where do I believe as a patient, I will benefit the most? And so having that uh, personalized medicine, a, a reality. Um, and, and I think we're, we're still a ways away from it, but we're definitely making progress. Um, will be something that patients will, will cheer for. Um, having, you know, a discussion with your, your, your HCP um, and understanding what options are available, it goes back to the shared decision-making that we hear time and time again. That's the, one of the most important pieces of a relationship with your HCP in receiving your healthcare. Um, I, I agree with, with you know, the, the potential for this. And as you read them, it just kind of took me back to my earlier comment. The applicability is, is limitless. Uh, and it's going to be fantastic and terrific to see over the coming years where uh, the pioneers and trailblazers to say, you know, what if I apply this sort of technology to your point to data analysis, to uh, medical information, to regulatory related activities? Where does that leave us um, to, to grow? What are the issues there? So we we'll be in a constant evolution of, of, uh, of development. Yeah, and you imagine, you know, we've been talking about technologies for medical affairs and just AI in general and what it can do for pharma, but then you take that combined with technology like CRISPR, right? And CRISPR gene editing and how that's, that's a whole other area, right? In terms of improving the manufacturing process, regulating apoptosis, cell cycle progression, things like that. I think that whole area combined with the advances in AI really is gonna transform medicine completely. And I think we're seeing that. And I mean, just when I think back to just a few years ago, the rapid rate of development. And then now, you know, we're seeing more than ever there's a lot more specialty products approved, more biologics, more biosimilars, 
especially this year with Humera now getting more biosimilars approved than ever, you know, for Humera. And um, that's that's a whole other area, right? In terms of, we didn't even get into that. I think that's another hour, right? In terms of cost effectiveness and how the outcomes research. But th this is huge. And this is one of the reasons why at the ACMA, you know, we had a big, big demand on providing education to fill the gap for biologics and biosimilars, for example. You know, we have a board certification, the first ever for biologics and biosimilars, because we heard from HCPs that there isn't much information out there. Um, and I think we're going to see more and more of that. And this is actually one of the reasons, too, why in our board certified medical care specialist program, the BCMS program, we have a, a whole area there focused on medical technology. So I think it's huge. I think it's huge. I see a question that came in, can AI help analyze insights from the CRM and generate patterns? That's a great question uh, from Linda Hadid. I think absolutely, the answer is yes, it can. Um, you know, the CRM tools, this is something that we looked at at the ACMA using things like machine learning. You can take large sets of data and analyze that data and then generate not just sentiment, but then maybe be able to make pr predictions using multivariate analysis techniques for the future. So I think the answer is uh, you know, a resounding yes for that. Um, Kiana, I know we have about 15 minutes left. I wanna make sure we have some time for other questions. So maybe we'll right. stop here and we wanna take some questions. Yeah, so I have um, a few questions that have come in. We've got about five or six questions that's come in. Will has already addressed one. Um, I think this whole question came in to your point, Will, about ACMA and what we're doing to build these skills. So question one, is there a hands-on training while learning in ACMA to build these skills? Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, I can take that question. The answer is yes, yes, yes. You know, I, I can't stress enough if you're listening on this call and you work in medical affairs, you work as an MSL, you're leading a team. Um, I think the future really of the industry is one where we want to establish level setting and uniformity around skill sets. And this is, you know, why I'm a big believer in competency standards setting through certification. We do it in many other professions. And I think it should be the same for medical affairs. And within the BCMS program, we have a lot of those content areas covered. And what's nice about it is, you know, when we talk about it, everything we talk about there is from the medical affairs MSL perspective. So the answer is yes. You know, the, the program is made up, if you're not familiar with it, of 20 modules. It actually has 20 courses in there. Um, so it's very, very comprehensive. And it gives you really a very nice broad set skill kind of overview of all the different important areas within the medical affairs MSL space. All right, next question I have is relating to the use of chat GPT. Do we know how the data entered are being used? For example, if text is entered, does chat GPT sell that data? And is that something medical affairs could use to gather insights? I, I don't know, Mina, do you want to answer that? Or I feel like that's kind of above my pay grade. I think that's the chat GPT mm -hmm. question. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. I, I think for many of these uh, tools, um, that exists in a space for AI, there's probably some sort of uh, disclaimer that that is uh, put on the screen when you first sign up um, to use the questions, to use uh, the functionality that that you're uh, you're entering your questions on. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they take that and refine their modeling and they refine their algorithms based on it, because that's the only way, or one of the many ways that it'll help um, evolve that sort of technology. I don't know for sure, but I would imagine as, as many tools that we sign up for online um, would probably utilize that data. Uh, what I will say to address that question, and I think it's a misnomer by a lot of people uh, about ChatGPT, people think ChatGPT is like a web scraper. It's scraping data off the web. And my developers explained to me that actually it's not. It's actually a, a trained bot. It's a trained robot, uh, a trained AI tool that was trained on, you know, large, large, you know, sets of copious amounts of data. So it's not actually scraping data from, you know, the Internet, for example, like a web scraper would be traditionally. Um, and that, that makes it very different. So um, but whether or not that data is sold and how it's utilized, um, you know, that's a great question. Um, the answer is, you know, ultimately, I don't know that that would be really back goes back to the makers of ChatGPT, which, of course, you know, we know Microsoft has one of the largest uh, stakes there in that company. Okay. Uh, we actually have two questions that um, kind of ask the same thing. So the first is, how does AI qualify the primary source data it uses to compose a response? Yeah, Can AI... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. 
Can AI help analyze insights from CRM and generate patterns? So that question I answered, and the answer is yes, it can do that. Uh, so that, that, that definitely can be done. Um, that just requires more machine learning algorithms to be able to do that, but that can be done, absolutely. Um, as to your first question, um, do you want to maybe, maybe if you could repeat that question just to make sure I understood it, it clearly. Sure. Um, how does AI qualify the primary source data it uses to compose a response? Yeah, so again, I don't know, Mina, if you have an answer to that. I, again, I'm not a tech uh, expert in terms of how they do that, um, but I would imagine it's relying on some type of back end that's based on machine learning where they've been able to generate responses based on constant feed of information coming in from users and whatever it was trained on. But again, I'm not, that's not my area of expertise. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think I'm under the same assumption. It's, it's really what you, how much you feed it over time that you allow the machine to learn, to expand, to uh, become more and more sophisticated. So it's, it's really what you give in is what it will give out to. Uh, but again, not an expert, I would agree with you all. Mm -hmm. This next question is a really quick question. Um, so how or what are your line of sight towards the possibility of AI taking over the role of medical affairs or medical science liaison, considering generational changes for young doctors and young KOLs and the rise and use of social media? You wanna start, Will? Yeah, I was waiting for someone to ask that question. <laughs> you know, so look, MSL bots and MSL chat bots and whatnot have been a topic of discussion for the last 10 years. Um, but it really hadn't taken off. And I think part of the reason is we within the industry believe that that relationship, that human human contact and relationship is still very important. Um, but given what I was saying about millennial physicians, eventually they're going to be Gen Z physicians, how they're going, what that's going to mean for them, I don't know. I think can it take over? Can it provide information? just as well today as a call center or an MSL, I think we're very close. I would say we're actually very close. But I think the, the real question though, Kiana, is will giving up those relationships, you know, having those face-to-face -face interactions with the KOLs, will that deter or impact the ability of the company really to work as closely as they want to with the stakeholder? I think that's to me more the key. Me, I don't know what you think. I, I totally agree with that. I, I also believe that that human interaction, to, to your point, um, is still warranted, is still necessary, right? So, so for you to be able to pivot middle of a conversation because of something the person in front of you said, that also takes emotional intelligence. And I don't know that we're there yet from a technology perspective. Yeah. It was very objective. You want to be able to kind of be the balance of objectiveness, but also emotional intelligence so that you're using that conversation, you're gauging that interaction um, and making the best out of it. Oftentimes you may have, you know, three different things come out of one discussion, whereas maybe a, a technology is just specifically focused on one topic, one item. And, you know, less human interaction, while there's a, there's a lot of controversy around that, um, some, some like it, some don't, I think there's, there will always be a spot for it, um, not to rush and, and to, to, to take the human out of the, uh, the equation. Well, I, and just to shift for a sec, what Mina said made me think of recruiting, you know, and recruiting and, and whatever industry you're recruiting in. So, for example, we have a platform called ACMA Recruit, where because we have a pretty massive database of MSLs and medical affairs. And, you know, if you're, a, if you're a pharma company, you can come in and say, you know what, I need to hire 10 MSLs. You can access our database and then like literally search for people that have those backgrounds as MSLs and medical affairs. And you can do it within the database very readily. And it, it puts into the question, you know, what, what's the role of the recruiter here, the actual recruiter, which a lot of pharma companies use a recruiter. And I think that goes back to the issue of that human interaction, that emotional intelligence of being able to decipher if you're sitting with a candidate, whether they're a good fit or not, those those things that are like you read between the lines that you might get when you're talking to someone, you may not get, right, from just having an AI database or a database and analyzing those copious amounts of data. So I agree. I think um, there's, there's probably always going to be a role for both. 
I think a bigger question, which is probably for a different a webinar, we could probably put that for is, what does this mean for pharma sales reps? Because like I was saying before, their, their amount of time with a doctor is very limited. We know that their, their numbers have gone down. We know MSLs have gone up. What is this going to be in the next decade for your traditional rep, you know, where they don't get as much time with a physician? You know, how much value really is being put there with a physician? That's a controversial question, I know. But I think it's something we have to probably look at eventually, you know. And then what does that mean for even thinking about AI and pharmacists in general? There's been a big conversation in the last year or two about the role of pharmacists and how that shifted. There's a lot I think we can get into and what that means for medical affairs. But um, this has been a great discussion. I really enjoyed it, Mina. And uh, thank you, Kiana, for, for moderating, facilitating. Yeah, thank you very much. This has been wonderful. Thank you. All right. Thank you for both of your insights. With that, I'll pass it back to, to Caitlin. Yeah, so that about wraps up our conversation for today for the Future of Medical Affairs Tools, Trends, and Resources webinar. Um, so thank you to our audience for all of your questions. Thank you to Drs. Kiana, William, and Mina for all of your input today. I think that really sharing your wisdom and experiences have been very insightful. So thanks again for that. Um, thank you to all of our attendees as well for watching. Be sure to follow us on LinkedIn and on YouTube, and definitely check out our website at medicalaffairsspecialist.org for more information about the ACMA. And be sure to register for our next webinar in March, where we will be discussing the value of board certification in medical affairs. So let's continue to